napaka-grand ng entrance, di ba? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to our uh, friends, to our guests, and to my fellow uh, educators and students in the law. Um, Gian earlier discussed about um, our future in the field of law. Um, but uh, for us to be able to know where to go and for us to have a clearer sight of uh, our future, I think it's best for us to know where we are right now. Because if we do not know where we are, then we might get lost. Right? And we might not know that the path that we are treading is actually not the path that we're supposed to go to. And so um, we have embarked on this particular study, which is uh, a legal practice analysis. And the complete title of the study is Legal Practice Analysis as a Platform for Proposed Law Curriculum Improvement and Bar Reforms. Um, the whole idea being that we need to establish where are lawyers now, what are they currently, what are they currently doing, okay. what are the fields of uh, practice that are prevalent as of time, so that when we prepare our own students, okay, when we prepare our own students for their eventual practice of the law, they are more equipped. They are ready. Okay. Now, it has been observed that um, the, rock, the law curriculum of uh, the past had been too bar-centric such that uh, a lot of law schools would actually gauge their performance based on how their students fared in the bar examinations. And I think that even up to this time, we still have a lot of uh, vestiges of that mindset. No? If not, that is still the current mindset that we have, that we are bar-centric. Yes, it might be true that uh, there had been some reforms that had been done to address that. Notably, of course, we have the issuance of the REMULAC, okay, the Revised Model uh, Curriculum, no? Law Curriculum, which is uh, more or less uh, designed to veer away from the bar centricity. Okay. That's one of uh, the innovations that we have seen during the past uh, years. The Supreme Court also had its share of uh, reforms in the sense that it amended Rule 138-A, which is the student practice rule, okay? and uh, has required that law students undertake the CLEP, the Clinical uh, Legal Education Program. Now, this study would be for purposes of uh, enhancing further these reforms that had been undertaken. Okay. It's not the first of its kind. We had a previous study in 2016 uh, focused also on uh, practice analysis. Okay. Uh, this particular study right now is um, inspired by uh, the thoughts of Commissioner uh, Jojo Sorerati, who in turn was inspired by the sharing of uh, Dean Hill de los Reyes concerning um, um, the California practice analysis. And um, I, of course, thank uh, LEAP for welcoming this particular study uh, because um, it's, it's really a good time for us to make our decisions based. Okay. Um, I think it's no longer a time for us to make our decisions based on 
anecdotes based on some isolated sharing of incidents that we might have uh, um, experienced or our friends have experienced. But it's best to take a look at the collective stand. Okay. And so I'd like to share to you the results of uh, the study. Next, uh, please. But before that, may I make uh, some caveat no, regarding the limitations of uh, the research. Now, the focus of this legal practice analysis is, as the name suggests, an analysis of um, how lawyers perceive what areas of law are they doing now. We are not concerned in the study about the societal needs, the societal legal needs. And of course, there might be um, a wide disparity between the two. Um, because some might not be engaged, for example, as pointed out by Gian earlier, in the fields of data privacy and intellectual property issues, which may be the prevailing legal trend as of this time. Okay? But we're not concerned with that, with respect to this study. All right? So that's one of the limitations. Uh, we did not take into consideration societal needs. We did not take into consideration needs of uh, business people. We, do not, we did not take into consideration okay, uh, the needs of uh, the various sectors, like the urban poor, okay, marginalized. Those were not uh, the, the uh, area of concentration of this study. We also did not consider here in this study our higher uh, learning needs okay, or those areas that we would like to put an emphasis on as a society. For example, human rights. Uh, if we just limit it based on the survey that has been done, we will notice that there are very, very few lawyers who are engaged in the practice of human rights law. Okay? Of course, we're not saying that it's not important, but we will just reflect how it is perceived based on the practice. Okay. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, these research findings that I will be sharing with you are actually preliminaries. Okay? It is not a full discussion of uh, the entire study because it's still ongoing. Okay? It will require a lot of uh, data processing on our end. Uh, we just close the... the uh, responses last November 30, so that we have uh, uh, one week to process and uh, uh, present the information that's relevant for purposes of our current discussion. So if you are interested in the full results, that will be forthcoming, but it will not be in this particular presentation. Okay. Some of us might agree with these findings. Some of us might disagree and some of us might even uh, vehemently object to some results. Okay? But uh, whatever may be our, um, our uh, feelings no? in terms of these results, the point is, let's have a conversation. And this, I hope, will spark some conversation. Okay? Now, let me start with this particular question. It's actually question number 37 in the survey. But I'd like to start with that particular question. Is there a gap between what is being taught in law school against those needed in practice? That was the question. Okay. Um, we took a look at the responses based on the years of practice okay, of uh, the lawyers who responded, thank you for those who uh, um, gave their answers. Uh, a lot of you are here, and uh, thank you for that. 
Dean Rosan even shared it in Abogadong Pinoy. Thank you for uh, sharing. Um, so we took into consideration the years of uh, practice, and this is what we found out. Next, please. This is what we found out. 76% of, actually roughly 77% of those who answered said that there is a gap between what is being taught in law school against what is needed in practice. 77%. That's the total. But even if we break down the total, you will notice that 78% of newly licensed lawyers, and by newly licensed, I, I use the standard of uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, survey, no? which is uh, three years, not exceeding three years of practice. Uh, that's the standard for a newly licensed lawyer. 78% um, of those who responded who are newly licensed, licensed lawyers also found a gap between what is being taught and what's needed. But interestingly, even the older lawyers, those who are not newly licensed, 76% right, of them also said there is a gap. Which I think brings home the point of uh, Dean Nina earlier, that there will always be a gap. <laughs> there will always be a gap. But we should try to Limit the gap. No? Wag nating hayaan na malawak. Right? We should not let it be wide no? enough. Right? Now, I'd like to share with you the themes that are arising from the answers to that question. What are the reasons for the perceived gap? Because there are recurring themes. If you note the responses, there are many of them. No? There are many responses. But the most notable recurring themes are this. The first one, which is very, very notable. There are so many who answered this. There is a mismatch or misalignment of law school curriculum and actual law practice. Now, let's take this into consideration. Those who answered the survey did not yet have the remolak. Right? Because there is no lawyer right now who used the remolak. Okay? So, all of us who answered the survey did not use the revised model curriculum. It's probably the curriculum arising from LEBMO number one. Or... Uh, a curriculum even prior to LEBMO, number one, where there was no legal education board convened yet. Okay? But um, there is that recurring theme of a mismatch between the law school curriculum and the actual law practice. But if you will take a look at the sub-themes within that bigger theme, these are the things that are notable and are repeated in the answers. The first one, law professors lack the experience and the expertise in actual law practice. As I've said, some of us will agree, some of us will disagree. Okay? But that is a recurring theme that has been observed. Law professors lack the expertise and the experience in actual law practice. Teaching methods or approaches by law professors lack effectiveness Professors' expectations that students should know the law. Sometimes we're, all, we're probably guilty of that. No? That we tell our students, before you enter your class, you should know the law already. Okay? But anyway, that is a theme that is recurring here. Professors' expectations that students should know the law. Resulting in less teaching of the law. There are more recitations and less teaching. Ito, nakakatawa lang ito. Monologues by professors. 
Um, and the uh, discussions and examples given by professors lack practical application. So those are um, the recurring sub-themes within the theme of uh, mismatch. And then the second one, which is also fairly recurring, is again the bar centricity of the law curriculum. Okay. Now, there is also a question in the survey um, how adequately did the law curriculum of your law school prepare you for your career as a lawyer? Let's take a look at um, the responses. Um, if you will notice, the columns at the right side with the red uh, font, no? those are the responses to um, the, the adequate preparation or the extremely adequate preparation of the law school to the career as lawyers. Okay? Um, it is very notable that only 10 to 18 percent of the respondents answered extremely adequate. So not even one-fifth of those who answered okay, have said that their law school extremely, adic ex extremely uh, adequately prepared them for the practice of law. Well, majority said that their law school adequately prepared them. But as educators... Should we be satisfied with that degree of uh, satisfaction that our students would believe that uh, we adequately prepared them, but we did not extremely adequately prepare them? <laughs> uh, of course, that would mean that there is a lot of room for us to grow and improve. And I'm quite bothered also, and rather surprised, that one-third of those who answered said that their law school did not prepare them at all, or it prepared them somewhat. One-third is a big number. Right? That for every three of us, one will say, my law school didn't prepare me. Okay. So that's something for us to think about. That's something for us to consider. Now, um, next slide, please. A big portion of the survey is devoted to um, the study of uh, the frequency of handling cases. Okay. Because we want to see what do lawyers do right now? So, we took a look at this particular area no, regarding the frequency of handling cases. Now, I will not be able to share with you the entire results. It's, it's quite long. It's quite long. Okay? But I'd like to, to point out to you a few matters. Um, this is how it was presented. No? Um, I mean, the, the survey findings uh, are presented. So, specifically, per area of practice, like for example, in this particular slide, okay, administrative cases that are disciplinary, 27% said they never handled administrative disciplinary cases. 45% said they, they did not, no? or they seldom handled um, administrative disciplinary cases. So if you'll take a look at the two uh, items there, which is none at all or seldom, you're looking at close to 70% of lawyers who have said that they have never handled administrative disciplinary cases. So what is the implication of that in terms of our 
curriculum design and in terms of our approach to the teaching of the law. If you know that this particular area is not much uh, paid attention to in practice or is not being done by uh, uh, most of the lawyers, then we might consider not paying a lot of attention to them during our teaching. No? We might probably be uh, discussing them in passing or for as matters of uh, reading, but uh, we should not be devoting a lot of time for uh, these particular areas, right? So, um, and so I'd like you to take a look at uh, you know, that list. I can share actually that that list uh, to to all to everyone. No? It's uh, consisting of four pages, a listing of the various uh, cases that are usually being handled. No, and you you will be able to see the frequency of uh, the handling by lawyers. Um, for those who will be uh, belonging to a commercial law group uh, design, uh, it, it's quite notable that. Uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of fields of law there where most of the lawyers said they have never handled that kind of uh, matter or dispute or case okay so that's something for you to consider in the design of uh, uh, the curriculum what are the components that you will have for instance in commercial law part 1 in commercial law part 2 knowing that these particular areas are not ventured into by uh, most of us. Okay? Ito, just again, just to present to you, okay, um, based on those uh, long list of uh, matters, cases, or disputes that are being handled by lawyers. These are the top responses. Okay, these are the top responses. Kaya pinili ko ito, no? Because I, I really want, I, I really want to share this with you. Uh, yes. All right. The first one is contract drafting or contract review. Um, now, the reason why I I, I share this uh, with you, that being the top um, matter being done by lawyers across the board whether they belong to the government sector or the private sector, okay? whether they are um, newly licensed or not, they said contract review or drafting is one of the areas that uh, uh, they had ventured into. Okay? And uh, again, what's the implication of that in our curriculum design as well as in our teaching? Um, as things stand right now, Contract review or drafting is in legal forms. And legal forms is a two-unit subject. We can teach legal forms as a subject where you give you know, some set of facts and then they copy from an existing legal form and then they submit the work without you processing uh, the information. Okay? That's one approach that uh, you could take. But another approach that we could take, knowing that Lawyers across sectors are engaged in contract review is you treat legal forms as uh, a sort of integration because you'll not be able to draft contracts very well if you don't know your oblicon. Right? So it can be a good source of integration if processed properly with the students. Okay? Um, Again, it's not really a matter of them just being able to know the forms because they can copy that. But how do we attack it as educators you know, such that when they practice, they have learned enough for purposes of them being able to effectively review and draft contracts. Okay? It's also a notable uh, thing that Property matters, and mostly dealing with land disputes, actually belong to um, the field which is often practiced by a lot of lawyers. 
And so it makes sense that um, a lot of concentration would be given to uh, subjects that are devoted to discussion of property disputes, land disputes, land titles. Okay? Because it's there that a lot of lawyers are actually uh, venturing into. And then you have crimes against property, crimes against persons, sales. These are among the top items in the list. Next slide. Now, there is also a portion that's devoted on the perceived usefulness of specific law subjects on the present law practice. And again, I just share with you the top responses. From the various subjects in law school, the top notcher <laughs> is evidence, followed by legal forms, and then obligations and contracts, legal writing, civil procedure, legal ethics, persons, criminal procedure, property, trial technique, criminal law, legal research. Okay. They belong to the fields, I mean, the, the courses that are perceived to be extremely useful in practice. Okay. Now, how relevant are the following courses in preparing law students for the practice of law? Again, sharing with you the responses. Okay. Um, eto, these, are, these are not specifically found in uh, the curriculum. Some of us might have this. Other schools might not have this. But the question is, if this were in the curriculum, do you think they will be useful? Okay. And uh, take a look at these uh, responses. These are the more... Um, useful ones, no? based on perception. Trial technique. Now, come to think of it. Go to the um, right side, the relevant and extremely relevant uh, uh, portions of the responses. For trial technique, the respondents, at least almost 90% of them said it will be useful. Child technique. Contract drafting, also nine, nine more than 90% actually, you know, um, said that this will be useful. Work life balance and stress management. We don't have that right now in the curriculum, but uh, we might consider you know, uh, taking a look at this. Okay. Regardless of how you do it, whether it would be a seminar type or uh, uh, whatever approach you may have in consultation with uh, uh, the experts of this on this field, probably try to consider. Um, interestingly, of course, um, a lot would still say that public speaking or co and communication would be a very relevant area of uh, study. Practice court or moot court is also among the areas identified. Legal counseling and client management. And internship or uh, practicum. Now, if you'll take a look at the items on this list, you will notice a common element. What is that? These are, most of them at least, are subjects that are devoted for practice readiness. And that is really one of the perceived gaps, no? in terms of our current law curriculum, practice readiness. Now, um, there is still that, next slide please. There is still that um, um, trace, as I've said, of our bar centricity, <laughs> uh, even in terms of our own perception, because when the respondents were asked about their degree of uh, agreement to this particular statement, no? 
uh, ang, uh, the, the themes here are, should the law school train the students to pass the bar? Should the law school train the students for the practice of law rather than passing the bar? Or should the, should, should the law school train the students to practice law and to pass the bar? Um, we will notice that the very strong agreement is with respect to law schools preparing their students both for the bar examination and the practice of law. So there is still that great degree of consideration that's given to um, the bar examination. Such that if uh, the bar examination would not move as fast as how curriculum should move, then our curriculum will end up being tied with the bar examination. You know, the usual comment, why do you teach that? It's not used in practice. We teach that because it's asked in the bar. Uh, it's not anymore, what's really needed? No? What's really needed? Okay? They will tell you, that's needed because that is being asked in the bar. It's not in the sense that it's needed because you need that in practice. It's needed because society needs it. No, it's needed because it's asked in the bar. Okay? So that's one of uh, the things that uh, we still have to uh, pay a lot of attention to. And as uh, um, persons who might uh, you know, be interested in lobbying uh, with our policymakers, this is probably one th one thing that uh, uh, we should look into. Okay. Um, now, earlier I said, of course, that one of the reforms that's um, done by the Supreme Court is to introduce the CLEP, Clinical Legal Education Program. And 76% um, of those who answered said that... Um, Yes, the CLEP is helpful. It is definitely helpful. Uh, based on how it's crafted by the Supreme Court right now, okay, which is to have the CLEP um, before the courts, the IBP, government offices, accredited NGOs, or law clinics. That has been found by 76% as um, um, something that's helpful. But a slightly greater number, which is almost 79%, also said that in addition to those, the CLEP should allow experiential learning from private law offices. Now, if you take a look at the recurring theme along that line regarding experiential learning from private law offices, uh, well, the, the, the prevailing theme is that the learning in a private law office is much different from that which can be learned from a government office or from an NGO. Um, I think the answer is not with respect to whether it's an or thing. It's not one against the other. It is one complementing the other. No? So uh, that's the suggestion that uh, experiential learning should also be allowed from a private law office uh, experience. In so far as... Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, Ole. In so far as this question, no, or um, the relevance of having adequate knowledge and skills along specific areas to prepare a student for the practice of law, um, Again, I'd like to share this uh, with you. Um, next, please. This is arranged um, based on the degree of uh, relevance as perceived. The first one is interviewing or questioning clients and witnesses. Okay? The respondents saw this as very relevant, that they should have at least a training on how to interview 
or question clients and witnesses. Handling and dealing with clients. Handling oneself before the courts. There was even one who mentioned we didn't even have a seminar as to how we should dress up, as to what we should do uh, when uh, we are facing the judge. Um, all of those were learned when they were already in uh, practice. But uh, some of them had wished that at the very least in law school, um, they should have at least a training or a seminar in connection with this. Okay? The determination of uh, the proper or the best forum to initiate legal proceedings, using technological tools to aid practice, knowledge of self or self-management, do's and don'ts of court appearances, negotiation or bargaining, and determining the need to commence legal proceedings or to refer to alternative forms of dispute resolution. So these are the um, more relevant uh, items that are perceived by lawyers that could have been uh, useful in their preparation. Now, what would be the implications of this no? for curriculum development and curriculum design? Again, as I've said earlier, uh, we can rethink of our existing uh, um, curricular offerings. Okay. Um, we can take a look at whether we are, we are really addressing the needs of our students for their eventual practice of law. But at the same time, okay, we should also reevaluate uh, how we do things on a collective sense. And that's why you know, I'd like to propose and present okay, this particular uh, paradigm <clears throat> that every student will undergo the phase of uh, uh, being at the entry level in their practice of law, yung blue na arrow. No? Um, and then in the course of their practice, they will become... Uh, more or less in their intermediate uh, level of learning, and then eventually progress into uh, their own degree of expertise. Okay? And within that progression, of course, would be different levels of knowledge as well as skills, values, and attitude. Okay. The knowledge can be provided by our curriculum, and what is contained within the curriculum, the course content. The skills, values, and attitude can be addressed by our students undertaking the clinical legal education program and other forms of experiential learning. Okay. But the question that I'd like to pose is this. Where does the bar examination come in? At least right now, the, for the previous uh, bar examinations that we had, there had been a constant commitment on the part of the Supreme Court to test only entry level. Okay? Test entry level only. But let me go further. No? Uh, even assuming that the Supreme Court will stand by that commitment in the future, that it will really be entry level. The question is, what is entry level? Who defines what is entry level? That's one thing that we have to look into. Another thing is this, entry level in terms of what? Because right now, based on um, how the, the um, bar examination is conducted, it appears that what's being tested is entry level knowledge. But what about entry level skill set? Entry level attitude and values? Would, would those uh, or should those even be tested? If not, um, how do we address? No? How do we address um, the needs of our students for such entry level skill set, values, attitude? 
And the second question that I'd like to pose also is, what about law school education? In our design of the curriculum, where should law school education stop? Is it at the entry level also? Meaning, just to address the bar examination? Or do we go beyond even to the intermediate level? Probably we cannot reach the expert level in the law school uh, uh, scenario. Probably not. Okay? But do we at least try to go into an intermediate level of learning? Okay? So that is one thing that I'd like to pose to all of us as educators. Okay? How far should law school education go? And then, of course, although it's not covered by uh, the study, what about its interrelationship with the MCLE? Because I'm um, hoping for that uh, future that a lot more of our MCLEs would be designed for purposes of uh, deepening the knowledge of, of uh, our lawyers, you know, the higher level of uh, learning. Okay? Uh, that, that's why I, I like the MCLE of uh, um, some government agencies like the, I, the Intellectual Property Office because their, their um, uh, MCLEs are designed for purposes of deepening the knowledge of uh, uh, those who attend um, in the field of uh, intellectual property law. So, again, I'd, I'd just like to uh, propose this particular... Uh, a paradigm for purposes of uh, our consideration as educators when we craft and when we redesign our respective curricular offering. Right, so um, I think that's the meat of uh, uh, the topics that are there in uh, the survey. Let me end uh, this uh, discussion by quoting um, RBG of uh, the Supreme Court of the United States, real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. Maybe slow, but at least we take that step. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat>